So, you target, you will be telling us about remote wavelength. Indeed. Uh, so, hi, I'm Arya Mishka. Um, I have been contributing to KDE for a long time at this point, uh, long enough that I don't keep count of it anymore. Uh, these days I'm working for Blue Systems, uh, and for Blue Systems we got uh, a request to improve the remote desktop situation in Wayland because we do a lot of Wayland stuff there. Um, so I will be talking about all these things in this diagram. It's, uh, while I was working on this talk, I realized that um, the thing I did work on for the past months is actually a very small thing that's sitting on top of a lot of other projects, including some within KDE, and it would be more interesting to highlight those parts of KDE because some of them are not very um, visible because there are libraries that implement some bits of glue that you don't see when it's working correctly, but you do only see when it's not working correctly. So I'm going to go through this in a bit more of a chronological order. Oh. <laughs> I'm not allowed to walk that way, right. <laughs> um, so, remote desktop. Uh, we used to have this thing called X, X11, Xorg, whatever its name is. Um, Xorg is a display server. It's, uh, it has a design that is set up to be client server. Um, it's which allows it to very easily do remote desktop, uh, remote programs because hey, you can just send that data over a tunnel instead of going through your local computer, which makes it for possible to forward any application to whatever computer you want. It's not great, however, because modern applications aren't written with this in mind. They, had, they run into various limitations. So along came a different protocol, which is called Wayland, which threw that all away and went, hey, let's optimize for the local use case instead of this remote use case. Which is great for the local use case, but then there's people that were like, but what about the remote use case? And especially people going, but I can't forward my applications anymore. And which is, as you'll see here, not necessarily true. Um, oh. So with that, we have another big piece, which is Quinn, which was started as an X11 window manager. These days, it's, I think, more of a, of a, of a Wayland compositor. Um, Wayland is where all the work, uh, a lot of the work happens. Wayland is um, where all the new bits are appearing. And I had a look at Invent to see if there was a list of contributors to Quinn. Um, there sort of is. It's a very long list. There's a lot of people involved with Quinn at these days which is good. So those are some of the basic features. Um, the thing is, the Wayland has a, sorry, no. Uh, so with, that, with those, we're going to our next step, which is screencasting. Screencasting was the first thing that is in this area, in the same area as remote desktop. Um, screencasting is a feature that's in a lot of various uh, video conferencing applications these days. I mean, I think we've all used it as, at this point because of some stuff that happened a few years ago. Um, and it's 
very useful when you're doing remote work to be able to say, hey, here, this is what I have on my screen. Um, so Alex Paul actually made it possible at some point to do screencasting on Wayland because we didn't have this yet uh, when the initial implementation of Wayland happened. Um, on X11, this was super easy because any application on X11 can just go, oh, I want to screen contents, give it to me and I'll send it somewhere. Which is also an, uh, immediately the obvious issue there is, hey, any application can go, oh, I want to screen contents and I'm sending it somewhere. So the screencasting implementation on Wayland is different. Um, and it's because it, th there is no network transparency built in, we need to do something different. And a bit of about the actual way Wayland works is we have an application sending its application content to Quinn. Quinn then goes, okay, I have these various applications. I'll combine them into one big screen image uh, using the rendering hardware. Which means that Quinn has all the information about what's on screen. So if we can plug into the point where Quinn goes, hey, I have my rendered contents, we can and pull that out somehow, then we can share that back to a user. So that's what's now implemented for screencasting. Uh, it makes use of uh, a lot of uh, some bits of infrastructure in Quinn to plug into this final bit, bit and then send it along as a pipe wire stream. So with that, we have one bit for remote desktop already because hey, we can get the screen contents to be able to send it to someone. Uh, there's another bit though that we need if we want to implement remote desktop, which is remote input. Luckily, again, we already needed it for a different application, KDE Connect, because KDE Connect has this remote input feature that's useful if you're just sitting on the couch. Um, so that was implemented. I forgot to check who, uh, admittedly. Uh, but so that's now uh, available too, which means we have another piece for remote desktop already. Um, there are, there, both of these things are, again, things that are doable, easy to do on X11, but are dangerous because you don't want random applications sending you, or random internet things to just send input to your computer, just like you don't want random applications going, oh, here's my screen content. Um, so there is a layer here uh, called XCD Desktop Portal. I'll talk about that more uh, a little bit more later on. Um, so those pieces combine, and it turns out that we already have an implementation of remote desktop because there's this application called our KRB, which implements. Uh, remote desktop over the VNC protocol, which works on Wayland. You can use it to do various remote desktop things with it, mostly seeing what's on your screen and controlling your applications. Um, it, again, it works, but then I tested it. it saying it works is about the highest praise I can give it. The experience is not great, on where, uh, especially, I, I'm not sure if it was the Wayland specific or if it's, but I'm, not, I'm reasonably sure there's problems with the underlying VNC protocol as well. So that raises the question, we can do remote desktop, but can we do better than that? Can we do something more with this? Um, so we, at the start of this year, we started evaluating this, looking at what are our options, what, what can we do, and I came up with a few requirements in my mind at least that were like, okay, we want 
something responsive. We want something that where we don't have to do the client side support. Um, and we want something that we can build on for the future. Basically, what I'm talking about, what I mentioned right now, is two very basic features, video streaming and input. But it would be nice to also be able to play back sounds and to integrate with your clipboard, to be able to send files between the machines. All those kinds of features are not, all, not, not the basics, but are rather important to have, a very, have an actual good experience with remote desktop. So, there, from our evaluation, there were, was basically one protocol that stood out as implementing most of this in one way or another, uh, which is the RDP protocol, which is in created, we had just been created by Microsoft for Windows, because Windows has, there are plenty of companies that need these features on Windows. So, it's, it feels a bit icky because it's, it was originally a very proprietary protocol. Luckily, these days, it's a lot more extensively documented, um, maybe a bit too extensively to my taste. Um, but it does support everything that, all those core basic features, but also many of the things I just mentioned that are not make the experience better. Um, the good thing is, there's a very elaborate implementation, free implementation of this called FreeRDP, which implements like almost the entire RDP protocol and which does both clients and server side of this. So this gives us an option to say, okay, if we can use this and somehow pipe in the other bits that we already have, uh, then, hey, we're starting to see an option here where we can do remote desktop with something that is hopefully better than VNC. So, those pieces are there, um, but we need to connect them. Um, one important bit there is, which is called Cape Pipewire. Uh, it was originally started by Alesh as well, um, because the screencasting and similar features in Quinn expose Windows over Pipewire. So if, an there, if there's an application that wants to make use of this, it needs to deal with Pipewire. Dealing with Pipewire isn't necessarily that something that you want to do every, every day, so it's nice to have this encapsulated in, into the library. Um, okay, Pipewire originally was started mostly for thumbnails in your task manager. Um, that was the initial purpose. Eventually, uh, we, because this is how screencasting works, uh, we started, there was some work started to look into screen recording, which is a fairly straightforward feature once you have screen casting that you just say, okay, now I'm going to record this. Um, so, KPIWire was extended with that. Uh, and now, KPIWire supports encoding your video stream from KPIWire uh, using FFmpeg into something that either you write it to a file or something that we added for all this remote desktop work, which is getting the encoding, encoded, just the raw encoded frames. Because we, for remote desktop, we don't need a file on disk. We, that, that's useless to us. For remote desktop, we want to be able to send the frames, again, to somewhere on the internet. So, this was one of the things that we started working on for, to make remote desktop better, or we extended this. Uh, because while working on this, initially this was just doing, using software encoding, which is fine if you're, right, if you're doing screen recording right into a disk, and uh, if, you're, if it's not relevant when, uh, when the file is finished. 
But for remote desktop, again, I mentioned it previously, latency is very important. So suddenly it becomes important that your CPU is doing a lot of work. When actually we have these things called GPUs these days. And GPUs, almost all of them, even the mobile phone versions, have hardware to do this encoding for us. We just need to somehow make wire that all that up. Um, so that's what we did. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, how do we get FFmpeg to take these frames from Quinn, these, these random things that come out of this pipe wire stream, and put them into something where FFmpeg can go, okay, I, I'm now sending this to the hardware, and then the hardware goes, okay, here have a, an encoded frame back. This, as someone, we didn't have any experience with this, this term was a lot of work trying to figure out. Um, one important bit there is that one of our initial implementations of this was still downloading the frames manually and then back, uploading them back into the hardware. This is an unnecessary step because you need this information to be in your GPU anyway, and Quinn, when it renders, puts this information in your, GP, in your GPU memory. So why would you download it to system memory only to send it back up? Well, it turns out that there is a way to do, to just tell your, via your, your encoding hardware, hey, this is where the memory is located, this, this is what you need to encode. But it's also tricky to get right. So this is, uh, so this is referred to as um, DRM import, where DRM stands for Direct Rendering Manager. Um, this, yeah, so this allows the application uh, to inform the various bits of, hey, there's some memory here in, in GPU hardware, please encode this, and then uh, later on I'll get that myself. Uh, so this bypasses CPU memory, um, but it's a very low level thing. Um, there's some bits, uh, I'm pretty sure Zaver and, and uh, Vlad there can, uh, can agree that the DRM modifiers aren't exactly API that are nice to work with. So. We, for example, we ran into an issue with Intel where it would, it, 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 it didn't support some modifiers and then we ended up with a picture that was completely garbled. Um, I, we eventually managed to fix that, but yeah, it's, it, it's we, we, get, we got it working, it took a lot of effort. Um, so previously I mentioned another big thing about Wayland is that applications aren't just allowed to grab stuff or send you input. So there's a level of permissions uh, management that you need to do where you, uh, you're, yeah, you should, because your compositor is, not, is going to say, yeah, oh, you want this screen content, yeah, I'm not going to give it to you. Um, without some form of confirmation that it's actually something the user wants to do. Um, so we have a thing for that these days, and then it's also, again, earlier called XGG Desktop Portal. Uh, originally, this was built for Flatpaks, which are sandbox applications um, where everything is basically locked down uh, including things like file access, so you need a way to, for that application to request from the user, hey, please give me a file. Um, this was originally built by, started by Jan Grulich, and uh, later extended by, with the various bits. Um, it's always used when you're dealing with a flatback um, 
these days we're also using it for various things in when we're dealing with Wayland information because screencasting is something where you want to be able to, to ask the user, hey, do you actually want to do this? Um, similarly, remote input, remote desktop, you want to ask the user, hey, is it okay if, if I start expose your entire computer contents to the internet? Um, the unfortunate thing there is that right now, the, specifically the remote desktop bits of the, uh, both the XGG free desktop portal and our implementation are a bit limited. The image here is what it currently looks like. It just asks you, hey, I want to do these two things. Do you agree or not? Um, there is no way to say, OK, yeah, well, please remember this, or please share these different screens, or whatever. So yeah, that is unfortunate. We're working on improving that. There's some uh, upstream work happening as well. So finally, we get to the last thing, which is called KRP. Not a very inventive name, I'll admit. Um, so KRDP is a library that I started. Our KRDP is designed as a library to make, to glue these bits together. All these bits that I've shown previously. Uh, so the XG desktop portal for requesting a session. Um, the screencasting for, from Quinn to get all the frame data in and piping that into pipe, uh, from Pipewire into, in this case, into free RDP so that it free the RDP can send it on to the client. Um, all these bits are, well, all, I, I say all, it's actually not that big of, uh, not, not that much code because most of it is done by other projects. Um, so, yeah, that, it ties it together. Um, I in implemented um, a, an executable making use of this. So from the command line, you can start at share your screen uh, over RDP to something. Yeah, oh, I'm talking about current state while, where I've most talked about most of this already. Uh, oh yeah, uh, tested this with various clients, uh, various of the RDP clients. They, many of them work. Uh, we are using a specific feature of RDP uh, to make it possible to stream H.264 streams, which means that not all clients work because not all clients support H.264 decoding. Um, the GNOME client works, uh, the actually Windows 10 client works, and a few, few more of those. So the idea is that you can start this on your, and, and any client will connect. We're not there yet. Hopefully, we will be there at some point. Um, the current state is also that we're nearly at a state where we can do an alpha release. Uh, our Basically, I've been trying to do an alpha release for the past two-ish weeks, uh, running into small issues. Uh, it should be any day now. Uh, for the future, uh, these were my plans um, that I had with this. Before I arrived at the Academy, um, we now learned that there's apparently a new thing from the VLC team that might be interesting. So these plans may change, uh, but there's still a bunch of work to do on the, the, the various other libraries that are still inter interested, interesting to do, like improve the remote desktop portal, uh, integrate this some m much more tightly into Plasma, our plan is to have like a simple KCM where you go, okay, I want to share my screen, just enable it, and that's it. 
And then on the KRDP level, we may start working on doing some of the extension work. Uh, that that bit is now uh, a bit more uncertain because of new developments. Uh, finally, I have a quick demo video to show about this. I'll see if I can. This was actually, um, I recorded this with David Edmondson yesterday. So. And I thought I had this. But this is David Edmondson using his laptop to log into mine, typing some stuff, um, and then being able to control the, it's, the typing isn't very visible, but uh, I've, we've, we've tested it, this between me being in the Netherlands and David being in the UK, and it, I was able to type into his uh, editor just fine without any uh, very big issues. And this is, this is already, for me, a lot more usable to actually do remote code editing than it would be, uh, than the VNC implementation was. All right, and that's the end of my presentation. Any questions?